unbelievable story that I try to keep as short as possible, but please bear with me about how I became Space Case Sarah. So yes, I actually <laughs> identify as Space Case Sarah. You can even ask these fine folk. I sign off my emails as Space Case Sarah, and I cool. actually just made myself an LLC. So <laughs> I am Space Case Sarah. And um, and all that I do, which actually, don't correct me if she's like, which is a lot. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it is a lot. I do do a lot. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, this is my my main picture on my website. This was actually supposed to be a test shot, which is why my kids are in the picture. Um, and there is a ton of hidden meaning in this in this picture. And so once I kind of go through my story, I'll uh, revisit this at the end and I'll point out all the things that that I kind of hid in this story. But um, so the reason why my story is kind of really wild, and I don't usually actually share this very often in presentations, but for some reason I felt like doing it today. Um, for me growing up in both my home life and my school life, this would be what a science textbook would have looked like for me. Um, I was raised in a fundamental, very cult-like Christian community that was very segregated from the general public. Um, and for some reason, I didn't question any of this. You know, it was the only thing I knew. Um, but I was a very troublesome child for them because <laughs> I did ask a lot of questions about a lot of other things. And um, by the time I got to high school, I knew I didn't want to stay within that church structure anymore. And I didn't really know what I was doing, though, at that point. So I first went to school for music. I was impossibly cool, as you can tell. Um, and I studied opera. Um, and uh, the thing about this was, while I was really good at what I did and I really enjoyed it, I wasn't quite prepared for the world outside of that bubble, that cult that I kind of was raised in. And so this was really hard for me. And I ended up dropping out of this major and um and kind of meandered through life for a while i did end up getting a degree in english and i ended up meeting someone that this relationship was not a good choice for me again because i wasn't very well educated in the ways of the world um and uh i really i just i kept everything at an arm's length if it was religion if it was politics if it was science i did not care i kept it as far away from me as possible until i had my kids so I had two under two. Yes, I almost lost my sanity. Oh. Um, <laughs> so Abby and Miles, they're only 18 months apart. And when I had my children, that was probably my first aha moment. And it was like, you know, I can keep everything separated. I can lie to people. I can keep everybody happy. I can do that for everyone else, but I can't do it for my children. So I need to start figuring out what I think about certain things. Um, and I had not really, seriously, I had not ever thought about science like in a serious way up until, um, and this is actually really common for a lot of science communicators, I saw an episode of Cosmos. <laughs> and um, it wasn't the, it was the Neil deGrasse Tyson reboot, but that very first episode that shows you the cosmic calendar from the Big Bang to where humans show up. And I was like, oh my gosh what else don't I know? Like, it just was like, Whoa. and, um, and then I learned about Carl Sagan and I learned about, you know, like the Voyager. So this is obviously the pale blue dot from the Voyager missions. And I just was like, I just was smitten. I was in love. I loved everything. And I watched everything that I could. I read any book that I could. And then I ended up getting, um, my first telescope, which is actually not this one, but a smaller dial. And I started doing sidewalk astronomy because I didn't even know that that was like outreach yet at that point. I just saw the moon through my telescope and I was like, this is cool. And so then I would just drag it out to the end of my driveway. And anyone who's walking by, I'm like, hey, hey, you want to look at the moon? You want to look at the moon? Um, and uh, so I did this for a little while. And then uh, my second aha moment after my children was um, I was coming home from an astronomy event and I got into a really bad car accident. And I almost flipped my car over. And in that moment, the only thing that was going through my head was how much by now ex-husband was going to be mad that I ruined our car. And so that was my next aha moment where I was like, this is not the life I want to live. Um, I was so in love with science at that point. And I had always this kind of illusion in my head that like, oh, in another life, I would have studied science. In another life, I would have done this professionally. And that was my moment of like, this is my only life. This is this. If I'm going to do this, I, I have to do this now. So the next day, I'm not joking. The very next day, I was calling around and asking people that I knew, 
hey, I, in particularly at that time, and I still do, loved astrobiology. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I was an English major, but I want to study science. I want to get into this. So I started um, really, uh, I started taking science classes at my local community college. Um, I got involved with a lab that has, um, they have some grants with NASA for astrobiology. And I was just like a student at large with the lab. I really started dedicating myself to this. I, um, personal part of my story, I started, uh, I started going through my divorce at that point. I knew that like, I just completely recrafted myself and all this was trucking along and then COVID happened. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, what do I do? Um, and a friend of mine who was in the lab that I was with was like, hey, there's this organization called Blue Marble Space Institute of Science and they have these internships and they're pulling them all online from, from because of COVID. And um, maybe you can find something to do there while this, you know, mythical, what was supposed to be one semester long hiatus, you know, passes. And I went through the list and I saw science communication. And I, it hadn't really occurred to me yet at that moment that like, you know, in my head, it was like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye and these people with these big TV shows. But then when I read like what other people do, where they're writing for, you know, um, writing for universities or they're, they're doing, you know, lots of different ways of science communication, not just on these big platforms. I was like, oh, I hadn't really ever considered this as something I could do. So I got into their program, <laughs> spoiler, um, and then I just really, really applied myself. And I, I joke, I'm the intern that didn't leave. Um, after my internship was done, I was like, so how do I stay? <laughs> and, so they um, first asked me to be a uh, producer on their show called Ask an Astrobiologist. So I helped produce that for NASA TV. Um, then this is about when I became a solar system ambassador. I applied for that. Um, I also started really getting involved with NASA astrobiology in general. So I am very involved with a lot of the scientists and the researchers and, and people involved at NASA. Um, I've been really, really fortunate. And I always feel bad admitting this. COVID really helped propel me in this time because everything was virtual. And so I was a single mom and I could go to these like national conferences and I could go to all these different things online and make all these connections. Um, so it really actually was a, uh, a blessing in disguise for me, so to speak, um, having COVID. And um, again, I got to go to all these different things that I had like, never would have had a chance to network in this way. And so one of the things that happened during this process also was I bumped into my now CEO boss, Bruce, who has a radio station called iRock Space Radio. And they had just gotten picked up by iHeartRadio because of their live content. And he was like, hey, would you like a radio show on my station? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I got my own radio show. It's called the Space Case Sierra Show. Um, it's on iRock Space Radio. We actually just branched out now to have our old episodes on different podcast streaming platforms, like everywhere. And we're also in the works of um, possibly having a visual element with another space kind of themed station channel. So um, just kind of that like right places, right time. And then the way that I'm acting right now, I'm actually a little nervous right now. So I'm not being as like, as I normally can be. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I was so... I was so free at that point. It was just, I talked to anybody and I was just so excited about space and that really grabbed some attention. So this really was a really lucky break for me, but I also, you know, I have the, the outgoing personality for it. So um, this is my quick little segue. I do a lot. I do a lot of things. Um, a lot of science communicators get scuba certified because it's as close as you can get to being an astronaut. So I too, became scuba certified. I don't know if this is going to play or not. Um, I dive in the Midwest. It's very cold, but I do sometimes, I don't know, I might not play for you. I do sometimes go diving um, in very warm places and I get to do things like swim with whale sharks, which was incredible. Um, so I was in the Philippines in October diving with, uh, well, diving in that area where we did snorkeling with the whale sharks. Um, and the uh, other personal part of my story the reason that I get to do all these diving experiences is because where I went to get certified to dive is now the guy who owns it is my boyfriend. So, um, <laughs> so you kind of have some perks. Um, so he and I actually also, we went to um, Mount Everest base camp last year. So that's something also I've done. So the reason I'm bringing in some of these big, um, 
big experiences. And this was incredible. I could give a whole talk on going to base camp. It's like a 14 ish day expedition that you go on and it takes 10 days to get up there because it's so high in elevation. So we, um, that is uh, 17,500 feet to get to base camp one. And yes, it's, you can't breathe. It's, it's very high, but that was an amazing experience. And um, I think some of the reasons that I have now gotten into more of what I do presently is because I, I just did these things. I just decided to do them. Um, and that is, it's probably not gonna play, but that is, that's Mount Everest right there. That's the tippy tippy top of the world. Um, so did you get all the way up? No, 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 <laughs> no. You know, it's actually, it's kind of scary, sad, heartbreaking. Um, there's a spot on the trail where there's a memorial and there's all these pillars and there's plaques on them of all the people that have died. Yeah. And I mean, and those plaques were like all the way up to 2020 when I was there, you know? Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of people. There's also fun stuff. Yeah. You'll, there you'll are, see them you know what? Fast. And you know, um, green boots, that's like the most iconic yeah. body. They actually, they, during COVID, they went up and they picked up a lot of the bodies and green boots was one of them. So green boots is not there anymore. Um, so right after I got back, right after I got back from Everest, I found out that I got selected to be a communications officer for the Mars Desert Research Station, which is in Utah. And so I went on a simulated Mars experience and that was surprisingly challenging. Um, it's actually like more spacious than you would think inside, which I know sounds kind of weird, like it doesn't look that big, but it felt more spacious than I thought it would. And every time you go outside, you have to wear a space suit. Um, the reason it was kind of challenging for me was because you also have to simulate a delay in communications and contact. So you can't call anyone, you can't FaceTime, you can't you know, um, have that face-to-face -face interaction. And that ended up being surprisingly difficult for me mainly because like my daughter lost her first tooth while I was gone. And then I also found out while I was on that expedition <laughs> that I got selected for this expedition. <laughs> um, and that was really hard because I was so excited. This, this, is, um, this is called the Droidage Resolution. It is a core drilling research ship that goes all around the world. It's funded by the NSF and I'm a communications officer for this as well. And I got selected while on my Mars expedition and I couldn't call anyone to be like, oh my God. <laughs> Um, cause this was, this, this was a reach. This one, I, I was like, there's no way, there's no way I'm ever going to get this. I filled out my application, bing, sent it off. And then I, uh, somehow got it. So, um, um, I'm going to skip this video cause it's just a video. So I got selected for this though, because we are going to, um, an area called the Lost City Hydrothermal Field, which is really interesting for astrobiology research. Um, and so, that is a huge emphasis actually of our expedition is this uh, studying of a very extreme environment for us to better understand how missions like the Clipper mission and um, other astrobiology minded NASA missions will do their research. So this was how I got chosen for it because I knew how well connected I was with NASA astrobiology. Um, and I'm actually really excited I got to add this today because we just got our logo, our patch like two days ago. <laughs> so the, um, the Lost City Hydrothermal Field, and I don't know if the video will play for you, is very cool because most hydrothermal fields, if you're familiar with them, they're very extreme environments where life thrives at the bottom of the ocean. But most of them are black smokers. So the, the, the mantle is pushing up, um, I'm sorry, the, the, like the magma you know, is coming up through the, the Earth's crust. This area is different in that the, the plates are splitting apart in this area. And so there's a mineral called olivine down there that has an exothermic reaction with the salt water. So it's creating heat, which is um, like microbial life thrives in this area. And it's also producing hydrocarbons. So there's all these things I'm trying to represent this, like there's the microbes and there's your, you know, your heat, your, your serpentinization. And um, they, um, they're very interested in studying this area because it's um, very much, in line with what many scientists believe possibly could be how life originated on earth. And therefore they think that it could be a good way for us to understand how maybe there could be life in the solar system. So I don't know if this will play or not. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see like the heat coming off of these pillars. Um, these spires are 
extremely tall. I put this in here just to give you that representation of how big that area is. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a very remote area of the ocean. So it's not easy to research frequently. So I'm very, very honored to be on this expedition. And I will be leaving for this in April. So that is coming up for me. Um, and I will breeze through this also, but I have been doing a lot of outreach for my expedition for this. And I have been managing this museum exhibit at UW Whitewater because I actually ended up going back to school to Whitewater to get a master's degree in communications because I kind of figured I I love science, but I also don't love the idea of being stuck in a lab and not getting to get out there and jabber about it. So I felt like communications was better for me. Um, and so this is what it looks like at Whitewater. I yeah, again, it's probably not going to play very well. So anyway, I came to talk to you all about the star party on the lawn. I got asked by um, Adam at Glass. Oh, if, yeah. yeah, if if I wanted to join this um, committee to put this on. And so then we came up with the idea, well, actually it was your idea, to do sort of like an MC um, broadcast it kind of thing. So I will be broadcasting my radio station live, well, kind of live, um, but we will be broadcasting this event while it's going on. It's going to be from 6.30 to 9.30. Um, and we're asking you guys if you would like to join us, um, whether it is by attending as a guest or if you want to come and do astronomy related things, I will tell you in the meeting I just sat in, we have almost sold out our tickets for attendance. So, and like we're already over half capacity of volunteers. So if you want to get involved, you probably should do it very soon. Um, wow. Yeah, it sold really, I mean, we barely even promoted it. And it's like- who, who are you selling the tickets for? Did you- $10? $10? Yeah, $10. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like that was a good still point. Recently, yeah, yeah. Definitely. yeah, we like, I shared a post once, and Yerkes have shared it maybe once, and we've almost already well over halfway sold out of the admittance tickets. So um, I think you have more tips on how to do a Messier marathon. I always tell everyone I'm the lazy astronomer. Like, I love the idea of doing a Messier marathon. You know, I found this little thing and I'm like, oh, it'll be fun, but it's also cold. <laughs> um, I will tell you too, if you are interested in doing the Messier marathon, what I learned from Adam the last time I was there is that the tree line does get in the way. So that you're not, no matter how much you want to, to do it, you're not going to get all 110 items. It's just not going to happen. But um, it's still a fun experience and, you know, a good way to nerd out with other astronomers. I am, I am a member of Rockford Amateur Astronomers. Um, I know a couple of them said that they would come too. So, uh, yeah, I mean, when it comes to tips to actually prepare for it, uh, all I think is like coffee and, I don't know, <laughs> hand warmers. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> one, uh, one thing I liked about the, how they get it set up is it's really a star party. Uh, the, majority of the lawn is you know amateurs bringing their telescopes uh, viewing objects talking about it right. and then we have the dedicated section for you know people like myself and you know nerds yeah, are the, really the going to nerd side out and the uh, fun side yeah <laughs> and then, you know you're doing a nerd thing say maybe like two minutes on a, an object you're moving to the next one you're moving to the next one um we will have multiple ev scopes so for those of you who've seen through the ev scope here you know, it's kind of a, a cool experience. Um, I will probably have some extra ones that are going to rotate in, I imagine. Yeah. You know, anyone interested? So you can try out the experience yourself, um, which is really neat. Um, and I will also say, just so that your expectations are set properly, the, the big telescope, you will be able to walk up to like the fence line where it's yeah. blocked off, but no one's going to be allowed on the platform, nor will anyone be able to look through the telescope. So don't. Uh, Get your hopes up with is that. Is there a weather plan B? No, there's not. Um, it's rain or shine. I mean, we will. So nothing the, can go indoors. The building will be open. Okay. Um, so the reason that the tickets are, I, I would assume, selling out very quickly too, is we do have a cap on how many we can sell. I mean, it's a good number, but still, um, they have it capped 
with the idea that this is the max capacity of how many people can fit in the building. Oh, okay. um, so if everybody needed to run, if everyone needed to run in really quickly, yes, yeah. yeah, so this is like <laughs> max capacity. So that's why the okay. ticket level was set to where it's at. Um, it is yes, rain or shine. Um, I mean, I will be broadcasting outside if it's a, not a bad weather night. Actually, it kind of seems almost more like a logistical nightmare for me to do it inside because it's so echoey in that dome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's we're, we're a go no matter what happens. <laughs> so we'll see how that how that turns out. <laughs> Looked at last year. Was, you can actually uh, see the arm with the Milky Way coming on up. Wow. Adam Adam was like, yeah, I don't want to jinx it, but we, I, mean, I haven't had a bad year since I started doing this. I'm like, well, what, way to say that now, <laughs> right? Like, way to go. So um, yeah, I mean, I can definitely answer more questions afterwards. So revisiting my picture really quickly. I will tell you the, the the secrets behind my picture. This I took at Rock Valley College where I took my first science classes when I really got into science. I love that my children are in the picture, even though I had not planned on having them in there because if it weren't for them, I don't know if I would have been as motivated to actively seek out what I didn't know. Um, most of these are Carl Sagan books that I'm holding. And then my dress is actually, each dot is a different color that represents a number. And so it is, um, spelling out if you will uh the uh the numbers of pi oh, so, so yeah <laughs> so that is my uh that's my as quick as i can make it feel so thank you for listening <laughs> and uh yeah if you have questions about the messier marathon in particular we can definitely answer those but it's it's not like a super serious you know what i mean like i think I'm, the majority of people are coming more just to have a good time um take a peek. Oh, exactly uh, it should be fun yeah. yeah, what what kind of topics do you cover on your podcast? Oh my gosh, everything. That's what I really love yeah. actually about the, um, my radio show versus doing stuff with NASA. Because when you do stuff with NASA, as you would know as an ambassador, yeah. there are lines that you must stay within. <laughs> yeah. Whereas on my radio show, um, we'll talk, I mean, anything. I actually have two co-hosts right now. Um, and we, we'll talk about the private space industry. We'll talk about... Um, astrophysics we'll talk about astrobiology we'll talk about you know just even kind of funny like funny topics we'll play trivia games with each other it just it's all over the board but as long as it's something to deal with space that's what we'll talk about but sometimes we do news yeah i enjoy it because i i do really like like spacex and, and what they're doing but when i'm an ambassador you know there's certain things i can talk about that i can't talk about so it gives me that a freedom to kind of do whatever I want. And people ask me that all the time too. They're like, oh, do you want to work for NASA someday? And I'm like, no, I don't know. <laughs> Not necessarily. Do you have guest speakers? Uh, yes, yeah. very often. Um, actually, so the, the biggest like oh, jaw dropping moment, I think so far for my career for me um, was right after Perseverance landed on Mars. Um, like that's but that's my favorite rover because she's the astrobiology rover. So you know she's pulling core samples and um and I I did this big emotional post and then out of nowhere, uh, Dr. Zaburkin, who was the associate administrator of NASA, he just retired, sends me a message and it, I was like, I just saw this man on national TV. Like what? Why is he in my inbox? And um and he asked me to do some social media stuff with him over this past summer, just one on one, and I like. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I, I've had uh, Dr. Zuberkin, but I've also, we do a segment on my show called Science for Good. Um, and we will bring on people who are doing um, like nonprofits and stuff for good causes. And that's actually gotten, gotten me quite in the door with big names and big people. So um, yeah, lots of guests. Just kind of depends on what So do you plan about. on getting a little more outgoing? No, no, no. I think I need to, yeah, I think I need to probably burnt rain it in. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's so funny. I, I did not know when I started Sidewalk Astronomy that this was like an outreach thing. To me, I just saw something cool and I was like, oh, well, yeah. Look at this. And, you know, I didn't realize that like science communication was something that I was so well suited for at that time. I just, it didn't, it didn't click until, like I said, thankfully the pandemic and I kind of just, Everything was has been like dominoes for me now. So the uh, the ship though, and I'm actually wearing my shirt for it tonight too, is 
is my big thing. We actually just had the uh, Wall Street Journal write an editorial piece on us that they just released yesterday. So like, that's such a Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's still kind of freaking out about that right now. <laughs> it was a big paper. I'm sure you have a long list of emails of people who want what you up to and <laughs> updates. Or, oh yeah. my gosh. I have it. Be posted, you I, know. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I have. Definitely a, a cutoff for this expedition because it's two months. It's yeah. a they're big, they're big expeditions. Um, and so I fly out to the Azores, then we go out to the Massif, and then we come back. Um, and so like this mess, this is this is my cutoff. I'm like after the Messier Marathon, like I'm really raining back on. on so the you're on the ship for two months. For two months. Two months. Yeah. Oh, neat. And the kids can't come with. No. <laughs> yeah, so. But I can at least I can I can call them. I can FaceTime them yeah. from the yeah. ship. Yeah, and I mean it's it's kind of almost like living on a cruise ship, but for science, because like you have food available twenty four seven. You can put a basket of your laundry out there; they'll wash it and bring it back That's the same day. Really um, there's a cleaning crew that comes and cleans your cabin <laughs> when you're not on your shifts. So, yeah, it's like like whoo, it's a tough life. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we will share it with one person. Um, usually. So the ship runs 24 seven. So like if you're on the day shift, then you room with someone who's on the night shift. So you get that room to yourself. But my, I have a communications partner. We're gonna actually share the room because um, we get, uh, we do ship to shore live broadcasts and they come like the timing of them because we get people from all over the world requesting these. It's just so like all over the place. It, it's not fair to have one person do day and one do night because it kind of ends up falling on one person too much. So we are bunking together. So I will be sharing a room more than anybody else, I guess. But yeah, it's not like the Navy. <laughs> like all the Navy people are always like, no yeah, I know. They're like, this is barely anything. You like. So, so do you have a website or how do you I how do, do. How do people find yes. out about your podcasts and stuff? So yeah, I, I do. Um, I so I'm, I'm Space Case Sarah. So you're just spacecasesarah.com. You can find me at Space Case Sarah, Sarah with an H. Um, and yeah, that has links to my show and the gazillion things that I'm involved with. I kind of reined it back a little bit on my website because it was getting a little, <laughs> a little too much. Um, but yeah, I'm Space Case Era. And then uh, you can also get a free t shirt on our radio station's website if you go over and sign up for our crew club. <laughs> so, for your what? Our crew club. We have a crew, crew club. club. I'm not really sure what they're doing with that at this point. So the cool thing about my radio station too is, you know, I have a show, but I have a producer, I have a sound guy, I have like a team. And so there's certain things that people are like, what's this for? And I'm like, I don't really know. You can ask them. <laughs> but yeah, spacecasesarah.com. So well, as yes. a science communicator, do you have any um, kind of tips for communicating with the general public about, you know, maybe... I Topics how to talk or, you know yes. some, some topics that might be confusing sure yeah no no that's actually something i really um yes. actually am doing a lot with right now with my expedition in particular um a lot of people has, even in astronomy i have found you kind of get this curse of knowledge where you know a lot and you start taking for granted really basic concepts that you just assume everyone should know that the general lay person generally does not know even, Jesus. yeah, even really, I mean, they, they knew it in second grade. Right, <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> right. So <laughs> like, yeah, like in, in astronomy, they'll be like, oh, that's that bright star. And you're like, yeah, that's a planet, you know, that's Venus. Um, you know, and you what take it. That? <laughs> <We can>. Right. <laughs> that's a plane. <laughs> it's like, oh, right, well. yeah. So I actually even in um, we're, we're drafting a lot of press releases and stuff for this expedition. And um, even today I was editing something and, you know, even the word serpentinization, like I know what that means, but you have to really break things down. So to your point, um, when I was in my internship at Blue Marble, they would remind us constantly. They're like, most people don't don't even know the difference between an atom and a molecule. Yeah. Like, think of it that simple. Break it down to that that easy to understand digestible level. And the one thing that I think makes me a very good communicator, hearkening back to the beginning of my story, I also remember not knowing quite a lot. You know, like for me, it was this 
just every day was like, what, 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 what? what? Yeah, you know, I just learned things <laughs> constantly and it, it's so exciting for me, it still is. It's so exciting to just, I mean, I'll read a book with my kids and you know, um, there was one book uh, we were reading and they talk about the leftover like hip bones and whales and I'm like, and they're like, yeah, you know, whales, they probably went, you know, out of the water and then back into the water and I'm like, yeah, yeah. you know but these are things that like lots of other people got to learn at a young age and i had no idea so um for me that's exciting like i i i kind of find it as sort of my gift it's my superpower like i am that genuinely jazzed up about what i do and what i talk about and astrobiology in particular for me when i first heard about it you know to to get to go on these expeditions to these really extreme locations to see where life is thriving like in acid pools we can find life if life can exist there i mean nasa used to always be like follow the water we don't really need to follow mm -hmm. the water actually um astrobiology nasa astrobiology does not like the term the goldilocks zone anymore because that's too narrow of a parameter for them so we're actually like discouraged from using it on the show that i produce um but people like it I know they do. It's easy it, to understand. Yeah, go, <laughs> right. Just right. Just right. But yeah, no, they um, uh, yeah, uh, Mary is her name. She is like, no, absolutely not, because it is. It's very limiting because there could be life in plenty of other places that are not that specific. So um, yeah, no, I I that's a great question. Looping back to what you were saying. Um, what, what about communicating with scientists? Uh, communicating no. to scientists yeah, the other oh. side of it, hearing their research and interpreting them and reminding them to, to remind them them. yeah that's why so there are some scientists who just they do not have the gift of communication Most and that <laughs> yes <laughs> so uh, <laughs> actually my my favorite story for that was um when they and it's been contested a lot now but when they released that paper of phosphine on venus oh, yeah. um one of our researchers at Blue Marvel was on that paper. And so I got to know about it before the embargo was list, lifted to write a paper or write a story on it. So I got that head start. And the guy gets on camera with me. And I swear, it, it he acted like his grandmother died that morning. Well, he just was like, yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, blah, 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 technical, technical. I mean, it's it's really interesting. I mean, either it could be life, or it's an interesting chemistry, and warrants more research. I'm like, I was like, it's good that you're not you're not like in front of the camera right now talking about this. Everyone would be like, how is this exciting whatsoever? So yeah, a lot of scientists, um, bless their hearts. They're, they, you know, they're, 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 trying, they're trying to, 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 Who's comfortable with me getting in their business on a tour, you know, with a camera and being like, what are you up to? Because um, a lot of them are just like, they like that. They like the antithesis of what I like, which is they want to be in their labs doing their one thing that they're specialized in. And I'm like, oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> to just be in the lab doing your one little thing. Actually, the, the lab that I was in <laughs> at large with. They do soil samples that are like one by one, and you get that for like the whole semester. Oh, and you just take samples out of your, you know, and then you run them, and you spend most of your time just running your samples through different, you know, instrumentation in the lab. And I was like, I mean, it's great. Somebody's got to do it. I'll talk about what you do. <laughs> I like too much. So, uh, yeah, that's how I ended up. I, I um, last year was like, you know what, I do want my master's degree. But I think I'm going to go for communications and kind of cater it all to science right. communication because I feel like that's probably a better fit for me. So, which is why I'm actually graduating while I'm on on the ship. <laughs> like I'm going to be graduating on the ship. Cool. You know, it's a real great skill, I think. And I think it's underappreciated is you know, journalists who are science writers. Mm. You know, yes. can, you know, write to the general public you know, these complex subjects. And to communicate it in a way that the scientists doing the research 
are capable of doing yes. that. So. And also don't feel, because uh, I've bumped into this as well, some scientists, they feel like uh, that it's kind of almost dismissive to their intelligence and the level of work and the caliber of what they're doing when you have to water it down that much and they get like almost insulted sometimes. Right. right. Yeah. Yes. My work was so important. Right. right. Like, my work. yeah. It's like, you know, it's a little more humble. Yeah. That's not why you're, that's yeah. not why you're yeah. Well, like that's that. feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's the degree, right? Yeah. Integration. I think yeah. there's, yeah. there's a there's yeah. every year a book comes up. It's a collection of who was probably you know science writing of 2020. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. yeah, or 2021, and and it's it's really top notch reporting. Writing. Yes, yes, it is definitely a craft. You know, it's a craft that I even still have to constantly work on because you know even uh, my expedition, there are so many times I'm running through our scientist prospectus, and I have to I have to make sure. I go and do all the research to make sure I understand what's going on in this paper because I can only be informed to so much of a level. But you know, I'm I'm just I, I've taken chemistry, I've taken biology, I've taken planetary science, I've taken atmospheric science. You know, I've taken all these things, but I also, if I'm not using it on a day to day basis, it's like whoop whoop. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know, there's still always always something I feel like I I could be improving on myself. Um, but when it comes to being comfortable to talk to people and really put myself out there, that I don't need practice with. I can do that. <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's why uh, I guess they kind of asked me to be a part of this because they're like, she likes to talk. <laughs> so are you going to be going around this? Oh yeah, I'm hoping to get interviews. And yeah, I'm hoping to get kids actually to talk. Can the camera work? Um, yeah, oh, like ask kids. them like, my favorite thing about space is so that's uh that's what I'm hoping to kind of now is to get some kids to interact. Selfishly, there's a reason for this because if you can get a kid on the air, then they call up grandma and grandpa and, and they uncles and you know aunts and and oh my gosh, Jimmy's gonna be on in five minutes. Yeah. So yeah, actually, how do, you, how, how do you deal with the having kids on camera? Don't you need to get three? It's well, with NASA, there. yes, you would have to yeah. do that. Yeah. Well, no, you don't. You have to do it for basically everything. So yeah. the yeah, yeah well, the the, the radio. I'm not sure how with your audio. I don't think it's the same. Oh no! So, so, so it's so not a no camera. camera. No, oh, no, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just an audio. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's not a visual. It's just, we thing. can't. We just yeah. can't have any pictures of kids. Right. Yes. Yeah. Ambassadors, no, we cannot. The harder question is how to get them to answer more than one word. Yeah. How do you like it? It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's bright. What are you looking at? It's blue. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I got some kids in my classes that it is. There's no end to their talking. It is. Yeah. I do a lot of you presentations get the right one, for school. Right and, and like, yeah, they. Don't yeah, they. Oh my gosh. I, yeah, and I did one. Um, I did one for a school. A friend of mine she teaches in Alaska, and I did one for her recently. And I don't know why, but the the Everest one, the Everest thing, like. Holy cow, those kids would not stop. But I was like, I guess I should have just come on and talked about Everest with you guys. Because like, how do you how do you climb up there? What do you eat on the way there? Well, well what like? Well, what do you eat? Oh, what do you eat? Well, that's a good question. It is. Um, yeah, no. So when once you hit the, the national no, so once you hit the national park, there is yak state there. But once you hit the national park, uh, because of the Hindu beliefs of the area, you can't slaughter animals within the park. So the only way to get food in and out is on yaks, and they call them yaks. So they're a hybrid of yaks and cows. Um, so they only can, uh, mules or something like that, cart in food. So they actually really discourage you from eating any meat once you're in the park because you do not know how old that is. I mean, even when we were there, that that like it's all trees right into it. Oh no no no! Uh, it's a lot of um. It's, still, right? it's a lot. It so every so you stay in tea houses, and each tea house they'll make food for you, and they all have a menu, and everything is exactly the same on the menu. They just kind of make it differently, but it's it's very sort of um kind of like Indian food fair, you know, a lot of rice. Um, yeah, there's ramen and uh. So I so for me, I'm like struggling to remember like what did I eat. I ended up eating a lot of popcorn. I got really like, like my stomach was just not like when you start getting that high in elevation, your organs start shutting down and your body prioritizes what you should be focusing your energy on. But a lot of people lose their appetite hiking up that high because you're, yeah, you're just not, yeah. <laughs> um, 
I did actually okay. My O2 levels, they monitor it every day to make sure you're doing okay. My boyfriend did not. He was, he, it was really bad. How long, how long did it go? 50s. Wow. He averaged in the 50s. This oxygen saturation? Mm -hmm. Could he converse? Could he talk? He was on his all fours hurling quite a lot of the time. Oh and then we got to base camp. And then the walk back was bad. It was bad, bad, bad. And our guide was like, you know, just convince him to That's take so a cool. helicopter down. Like, just, you made it to the top, charter a helicopter down. And I was like, well, I don't, I can't convince this man who's a, an ex Marine. I can't convince him. But, <laughs> oh um, and, <laughs> and, um, and so he finally yes, was kind of like, I mean, yeah, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, he was, he was shutting down. And he finally was like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I should. And then a blizzard moved in. And that was a really freak snowstorm. So oh, we had to walk back in the blizzard. That was actually the scariest point for me because we start heading out and there's 12 of us in our group. And um, I'm like, I'm the only one kind of nervous. I think it's because I'm the only one who has little kids in the group too. So I'm like, is this the story of the 12 hikers that head out into the mountain and are never seen again? Because it was just like, whoosh. And even our, our head Sherpa kept like looking back and he's kind of looking a little uncomfortable too. And like at one point we're walking through bushes and I'm like, we are not on the trail right now. We have to die. <laughs> it was really, really intense like a few days those days. How are your OT levels? Mine were good. Mine were actually good. I think the lowest I ever got was like low 90s. I, oh, wow. I yeah, I stayed wow. really good. Oh, yeah. uh, no, that's not bad at all. No, not at all. But yeah, I mean, it really depends on the person because we had one kid in the group who was 17 and he had one day where he was like in the 60s. Like it was, oh yeah, God. he was bad too. Um, so it's just, it's your individual body. Some people can handle that, that kind of elevation and some people can't. So yes, yeah, so I know everyone's like, well, that sounds like a fantastic vacation. <laughs> it was it was absolutely amazing. There's actually an observatory up there too. It was shut down, but um, I took a picture of the sign. Uh, it was like it's so funny because I I went to the Mars thing afterwards, and everyone was like, "Wow, isn't it beautiful here?" And the landscape, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, when you see the Himalayas, your you your standards of a mountain change forever i mean there were some times where we would just we'd be going up all day and then we hit this platform and it's just oh. yeah i definitely cried a few times <laughs> on the on the trail because it's just it's they got selfies i took quite a lot of pictures <laughs> i and people are like would you do it again yeah 100 percent. i was like the most incredible what about your boyfriend he wants you to too. But he could be able to get supplemental oxygen. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but he has brain damage now. now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had that before from eating all the crumbs, but you know. um, yeah, the uh, I mean, 60 is ICU level, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, and then it was bad. There's nowhere in, in the clinic where we would allow right at sea level, yeah, definitely. You get yeah. you get drop even into the low 90s, and that's like not right. good looking, yeah. On the mountain, they're like, yeah, if you're in the 80s, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an experience. I will yeah. tell you, it was something I will not forget anytime soon. Was it clear up there? Absolutely, yeah. Except for that three three day snowstorm, it was. Um, yeah, so the the guide said some of the clearest weather they've ever seen. So our views were just phenomenal. Yeah, it was cold though. It was really cold. No, that's also <laughs> it was really yeah. cold. Um, there was a uh, one tea house, two tea houses that we stayed in. One was. Um, the highest monastery in the world. I don't even know why they bothered with windows and doors because it didn't feel like that helped at all. <laughs> and then there was another one where it was so, 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 so cold. You look up and you see the ceiling sparkling from all the ice from your condensation. <laughs> and then they were like, yeah, um, just go out in the courtyard to pee because the toilets, because there's usually pit toilets, they're so frozen over and just gross. They're like, it's safer to just go to the courtyard to go to the bathroom because, you know, and mind you, we don't even date for like six months yeah. at this point, too. <laughs> that is a uh, that's a, a date by ice, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so then it was kind of funny, like them going to the Mars Desert Station, which was all dehydrated food, which is but how long were you in there? Two weeks. 
So that wasn't too bad of an analog. Um, but dehydrated butter is the worst thing I think I've ever oh, had. Is that, is that in Arizona? That's in Utah. It was in Utah. Yeah, yeah, yeah near Hanksville, which Should is. Still add water to it? Yeah. No, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Did you add water into it? Oh, no. It's just flavor. It's, it looks beautiful. It looks like whipped butter. You're like, oh, this would be delightful. And then you have it, and you're like, nope, nope, nope. nope. <laughs> have some scones. Yeah, and then the, the dehydrated meat also like uh, smells like dog food. Um, yeah. Uh, it doesn't taste that bad. Corned beef hash, that's what it's like. Huh? Yeah, uh, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, that one was weirdly hard for me. I think it was because I didn't know anyone on the crew. I was the only woman. And so, like, I got the news that I got my ship expedition, and I just was like, oh, my gosh. And they're all like, like your space case there. And I'm, like, sitting there like, oh, I wasn't supposed to get there. I shouldn't be. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you know, like, okay, she's a little, little weird. So, um, yeah. Uh, so we'll see how I do on the ship. <laughs> I, I, I think I'll be okay. The thing I heard that most people struggle with, especially in extreme expeditions like mine, is when you're leaving. That initial watching the land disappear when, and knowing that's the last it. time you're going to see it for two months. Yeah, that I've already tried to kind of mentally prepare myself for that. Um, but otherwise, I mean, we're so busy constantly working. You don't really have a lot of time to get too homesick board um from what i've heard so 